Uh, so first, uh, thanks for everyone to join us today's face-to-face -face meeting in Beijing. Uh, first, please let me introduce myself. I'm Angela Cheng, uh, who is uh, Chinese uh, Colonel School of China Business Development here. Uh,非常感谢这次今天就是各位的来宾 So first, please let me introduce our today's guest uh, First is uh, Mr. Qin, he's from um, Beijing office And then the other two gentlemen that are from Multico uh, company the medical company is also, uh, it is based in the U.S. and they are also one of the Kronos members here. So we are very happy to get and join us today. <laughs> now I will introduce our two team to them uh, in Chinese. Yeah. Uh, then I will introduce our two team to them in Chinese. 呃，介绍一下今天我们这个会议的出，呃，就是我们这个Kronos的团队。呃，首先向大家介绍的是Neil Travis先生，呃，他是Kronos Group的主席，同时呢也是NVIDIA移动内容的副总裁。嗯，Neil Travis先生。然后，嗯，下一位是Elizabeth Rigger，呃，她是Kronos Group这边呃市场总监，主要是负责Kronos Group的呃市场的所有的活动。然后下一位是John Paddy,John Paddy是来自JPR,然后他也是这次我们这个,在那个活动也有非常重要的一位。好,然后呢,我会从左边一一向大家介绍其他的就是我们公司其他的一些会员公司的成员,他们有来自美国,英国,包括日本,韩国,
Uh, we have good market uptake. Um, many of our um, APIs now shipping in operating systems like Android and uh, OpenGL ES, which is our uh, first mobile API, is now shipping in hundreds of millions of devices. And the APIs that we create are royalty free, so they're free for the industry to use. And these APIs have been uh, able to help the devices in the mobile space become more and more capable over the last few years. Until now, we have this explosion of mobile uh, capability. So, um, some of the, the history of Kronos, we just passed our 10-year birthday. We were born back in uh, 2000. Uh, the first mobile API we created was OpenGL ES for mobile 3D graphics. Um, in 2004, uh, we started the Open Max working group for video, audio, and image processing, and OpenVG for 2D vector graphics. In 2005, the Collada working group joined Kronos, and that's the one standard we have that's not an API. It's a 3D file interchange format, and we've started open SLES for sound or audio processing. Uh, in 2006, the OpenGL R. Uh, OpenGL was originally created and governed by Silicon Graphics. Uh, but in 2006, Silicon Graphics transferred the control of OpenGL to Kronos. In 2008, uh, we formed the OpenCL working group for parallel computation. Uh, in 2009, the first web API, uh, WebGL, which is to bring uh, 3D graphics to HTML5. And then uh, in 2011, we had this burst of activity around vision and sensor uh, processing uh, with stream input and OpenVL. And we now have WebCL, which is our second uh, web API to bring compute to HTML5. And we have currently over 100 members and in total uh, about 15 standards that are being actively uh, maintained. So here's um, the logo chart. Um, a lot of these companies uh, are in Asia, uh, but we don't have any Chinese members. And that's why we're here. I mean, we realize you know, you're, you're here, that your companies are based in, in uh, UK and US. Um, it's a um, big opportunity, I think, for the Chinese industry and Kronos too, to foster more engagement from the Chinese industry in these standards, and you know, that's precisely why we're here uh, this week. So uh, the value proposition of the Kronos uh, APIs, um, we have a proven process that lets us create um, uh, API standards, and so we can efficiently uh, bring the harder industry to consensus as to what functionality we're going to ship in future silicon and what the APIs will be that enable that uh, functionality to be accessed by the software community. So we gather industry requirements, uh, we draft specifications, those drafts are confidential to the Kronos members. And then once we have consensus and Kronos agrees, uh, we release them publicly and companies can create products royalty free. If you're a Kronos member, then you get a number of uh, advantages from your membership. Uh, you see an early window into the industry technology requirements as they're being formed and gathered uh, into the working group. Uh, you have a voice and a vote in how those technology standards uh, are developed, uh, and because you're seeing the drafts being created in real time, it is possible for you to begin to develop products, if you wish, uh, in parallel uh, with the drafting process. So your product is earlier to market than if you have to wait for the full public release. Uh, we find that for many members, that is the key uh, advantage that Kronos membership brings, and of course, um, by using Kronos standards, uh, we are working hard to make sure that the specifications are in sync with the needs of the industry. So uh, the working group process, every uh, API that's active has a working group, and the working group is made up of the membership, uh, which consists of 
uh, contributor members. That's the standard membership. Uh, so you get to participate in any of the working groups that you wish. Uh, and it's one company, one vote. Uh, we have promoter members, which pay a little more, uh, but also get a seat on the board of directors. And then we have academic membership uh, for accredited uh, institutions, and they can participate in the working groups, but they don't get a vote uh, in, this, in the creation of the specifications. The working groups, their primary product is ratifying specifications, but it's just as important the working groups create performance tests, so we have a means of testing that our uh, API implementation is meeting the spec precisely. And we also try to create SDKs and samples, reference cards, uh, materials so the developers can understand the APIs that we've created. Companies that wish to use uh, the specifications um, are adopters. You can be an adopter with or without being a member. Um, you pay a small fee, you get access to the conformance tests, and you can call your product conformant. And then, of course, developers will use the API implementations from those OEMs and uh, develop great applications uh, using the power of the SIP. So the cooperative model um, uh, has a number of different aspects. The, the specifications that Kronos creates are, are actually quite valuable. Um, they're the result of many hundreds of man years of engineering time from some of the leading experts uh, in the industry. So the specifications we create are uh, very well engineered and well uh, considered. But we want these APIs to be royalty free. And so we have an IP framework uh, in Kronos, which in summary says that every member in Kronos agrees not to sue uh, other uh, Kronos members over their IP if they ship a conformant implementation uh, of the specific specification. And in today's environment, uh, that uh, agreement from the other Kronos members is of some considerable uh, value. So Kronos is a, uh, a forum that has a solid legal framework to enable competitors to come together and to cooperate for the advancement of the market. And many people ask, how does Kronos make money? Uh, the answer is, we don't. We are a non-profit organization. Uh, we have fees, membership fees and doctor's fees. That's just to cover our costs. We are focused on creating market opportunities for our members and the industry, not uh, creating uh, money for our own sake. So conformance is key. Uh, you, you don't get the IP protection and you can't use the trademarks if you're not conformant. And so how do you uh, become conformant? If a company is implementing a Kronos specification and wishes to use a trademark in association with an implementation, um, we have a set process. We maintain an adopters program uh, to enable companies to come and be conformant. Uh, so you execute an adopters agreement, and it's normally a small fee, typically around $10,000 or so, which lets you submit an unlimited number of products. And at that point, you can make restricted use of the trademark. You can use the name, and you have to put a small disclaimer uh, in the materials that you use uh, at that point. But you can state you've become an adopter. You import and execute uh, the tests onto your product. Uh, when you're ready, you can upload the test results and you enter a peer review period. And at that point, you can use the logo uh, in association with your uh, product if it's uh, already uh, shipping, perhaps in beta, perhaps. And the, um, you still have to put a small disclaimer. But after 30 days, if there are no problems with your submission, uh, you become fully conformant and you can make full use of the trademark and the logo. And your product will be um, promoted on the Kronos website. The, um, we have a number of projects 
um, number of activities inside Kronos. Many of them require funding. Uh, we have a general fund inside uh, Kronos, and any company member or individual can um, suggest a project that Kronos undertakes. Uh, the board of promoters, that's the board of directors, meets every month and will consider all of the submitted projects and will uh, either uh, approve them or will ask for more feedback or updates from the submitters. So, members should feel free to make project proposals uh, if they see that Kronos is, needs some extra uh, activity, uh, particularly here in China, if we need translations, for example, of um, uh, specifications or websites or other engineering work specific to the Chinese market. Now, we rely on the Chinese membership to bring that to our attention and to make that proposal. So, um, what have we achieved in the last 12 months um, working at Kronos? It's been actually a busy 12 months. But back in January 11, uh, we released 1.1 of OpenMax AL and OpenSL Yes. Um, in March at GDC last year, we released WebGL 1.0 and we announced the stream input. Working Group and Clara 1.4 performance tests were made publicly available. Uh, in August last year, we announced WebCL and uh, OpenGL 4.2 was publicly released. That was at SIGGRAPH. Um, and then uh, at uh, SIGGRAPH Asia, we released OpenCL 1.2. And then finally, at the end of the year, we announced the Computer Vision Working Group, uh, which is the newest working group. That's now called OpenVL and we released the EGL streams uh, spec from the EGL working group. So it's been quite a lot of uh, specifications released over the last uh, 12 months. So um, looking forward though, it's interesting how the nature of the kernel's APIs has changed over time. Um, when the R started with Silicon Graphics, uh, all of the innovation was in the, the high-end systems, the workstations and high-end PCs. OpenGL is the granddaddy of all of the APIs, and OpenCL uh, is uh, being developed primarily first for use on high-end systems before it migrates down to mobile. But now mobile is where a lot of the innovation is occurring. Uh, we need to have advanced functionality in mobile devices, and the APIs have, a, have to deliver that functionality at low power levels. But now we're moving on to the next wave of innovation, um, where applications in the mobile space are beginning to embrace mobile devices, their uniqueness, they're no longer just small PCs. Uh, there are many more sensors on these mobile devices. They know where they are, they know which direction they're pointing, uh, they have multiple cameras, um, and so we need the APIs to enable developers to reach all of those sensors, and we need to enable developers to use all the APIs together for new wave applications like augmented reality, for example. And then finally, as silicon gets lower and lower power and more and more pervasive, uh, all kinds of devices are going to have this rich compute capability. Uh, your car, uh, your consumer electronics devices, as well as your phones and tablets. It creates a real challenge for the developer community, uh, portability across multiple platforms becomes even more important, and it looks like HTML5 could be uh, the cross-platform uh, programming framework that enables right once run anywhere uh, genuinely for the first time. And so we're be bringing some of the graphics and compute capability into HTML5 with WebGL and WebCL. So, a lot of the presenters later are going to give us updates on each of those uh, APIs. I'm going to talk a little bit about the vision and the uh, augmented reality and sensor APIs uh, because they're not going to be covered uh, later on. Uh, augmented reality is an interesting use case. And we're talking about vision-based augmented reality where we use the camera to track features and objects in the scene and create a uh, camera to scene transform 
So we can generate augmentations that are locked to the pixel level uh, on the scene. And then we bring uh, augmentations and the original video scene back together and composite them together to create a augmented scene for the user. This needs everything uh, in the device uh, to work together. So it's kind of the dream use case, or many people consider it the, the nightmare use case uh, to bring everything together in one, one application in a power efficient way. So some of the APIs that we're creating for this new wave of visual and um, uh, augmented reality type capabilities, stream input is an API for sensor fusion. Uh, application developers need to access all of the sensors in a device, but to do it in a portable way. Uh, it's quite a challenge. Today, you have to kind of know which accelerometer, which camera you're using often to get the best performance. Stream input lets the developer request semantic level information, such as give me gesture processing, or tell me when I'm in, a, in an elevator. And stream input middleware will use the sensors and provide a high quality sensor stream back to the application in a very portable way. Uh, it sounds challenging, but we have some of the key uh, players in the industry, such as uh, uh, PrimeSense, which is the, the technology company behind Connect, for example, are participating in that working group. So we have a lot of uh, industry experts contributing their experience and their knowledge. OpenVL is our newest working group, um, Open Vision Library. Uh, it's a hardware acceleration layer for uh, vision acceleration it can be used for libraries like OpenCV, which in the past have been this big mass of open source software, uh, a thousand or more functions. It's very difficult to accelerate a thousand functions over time. OpenVL is intended to be a well-defined hardware acceleration layer for vision type operations that the silicon vendors can optimize and accelerate and provides a good platform for applications or vision libraries to port and be accelerated uh, in a reasonable way. So uh, all these various functions and APIs and the APIs that we've had at Kronos for a while, for the first time we can create an augmented reality processing flow uh, where there are no gaps using uh, open standards. So uh, for creating an open uh, augmented reality application, we need to control the camera and do low-level image processing close to the sensor. We can use OpenMax AL. Uh, we need to do computer vision and tracking. We can use either OpenVL or OpenCL if we want to go down to a lower level. Uh, we need to bring in all of the other sensors and do sensor fusion. Uh, that's the domain of stream input. We need to do the 3D rendering and composition. That, of course, is OpenGL ES. Uh, EGL streams provides a very efficient transport from the video subsystem to the graphic subsystem. And we might want 3D positional audio, and that's the domain of open SL ES. So we've only been able to draw this flow with no gaps for the last few months. And some of these APIs are still in development. So if you uh, are interested in this kind of augmented reality flow, now's the time to, to get involved and make sure uh, that these standards evolve in the way that you want them uh, to go. The vision is a very interesting stack. We have a number of different um, initiatives and third-party uh, open source libraries that make up a, a vision stack, and they all kind of hang together. So you can use um, OpenCL for implementing uh, Open, that's meant to be OpenVL, uh, you can use OpenVL for accelerating libraries such as OpenCV. Uh, you can use libraries like OpenCV for doing the tracking inside stream input. Uh, you can interoperate um, uh, OpenVL with OpenMax AL for camera control and will make sure that the vision acceleration also uh, can interoperate with OpenGL, OpenGLES, and OpenCL. So you can have vision, compute, and graphics again, all in a uh, unified application. So having these APIs is good, but if they don't ship in real products, there's really not much point. 
Uh, but the good news is that many OSs are adopting these APIs, in particular uh, Android, uh, is proving to be uh, a relatively open platform for innovation. Uh, and Android is uh, adopting these APIs over time. So OpenGLES shipped in Android 2.2, OpenSLES shipped in 2.3, OpenMaxAL uh, shipped in 4.0, that's ice cream shaft sandwich. Uh, EGL, turns out, has been there for a while, uh, but it's becoming closer and closer to be exposed to directly to the application developer, uh, particularly EGL streams. OpenCL stream input and OpenVL, not yet uh, adopted, um, but our uh, philosophy is to keep developing good app APIs that add value, and hopefully Google will adopt over time. And in the meantime, before Google adopts, uh, Android has the flexibility that um, OEMs can extend the NDK, the Native Development Environment. Uh, I think everyone will be careful not to break the Google APIs that are there, but we can add additional functionality on the side of those APIs to provide differentiation. But because we're using open standards and all of the silicon vendors are participating in their, their creation, we can add this uh, differentiating functionality without too much fragmentation and hopefully make a good case for Google to adopt them uh, over time. My last subject is uh, HTML5. Uh, we have the browser being pressed into service as a cross-platform uh, development uh, environment. Um, so we suddenly need the browser to know all about 3D graphics and cameras, and vision processing, and parallel computation, all these things that we've been discussing for native. How can the browser community quickly get that functionality? Uh, our suggestion is not to reinvent those APIs, but to use the work that's already been done in the native space and simply expose that functionality appropriately in uh, JavaScript for web development. WebGL is precisely that. It's a JavaScript binding to OpenGL, yes. Uh, we're already working on WebCL, which is a JavaScript binding to the OpenCL, heterogeneous parallel programming environment. Uh, we have uh, Web Audio, which is a Google initiative, and we're working with Google to make sure we can use APIs like OpenMax to accelerate that audio functionality. There's um, a vector graphics APIs, such as Canvas and SVG. Um, and those groups inside the W3C are now investigating using GPU acceleration, either OpenGL, OpenGLES, or OpenVG. And then there's other forward-looking possibilities. Um, better camera control, uh, vision processing, sensor fusion in the browser, and perhaps we can use the native APIs that we're developing at Kronos to enable those into the browser quickly. So WebGL is this combination of um, JavaScript binding to OpenGLES and using the Canvas tag that's inside uh, the browser. So we can declare essentially a 3D context for the Canvas and use the full power of the OpenGLES 2.0 API uh, to generate 3D uh, in the browser itself. There's no plugin required. The browser has become a, a 3D player. Uh, in its own right. And we have WebCL, which is under construction. The browser vendors haven't committed to ship it yet, but they are participating in the working group, and, it, and that enables web developers to reach into OpenCL for parallel computation in the browser. And I have one uh, demo which I'll show quickly. So this is a prototype WebCL implementation. Uh, this one has been implemented by Samsung, and it's running on a, a Mac platform. It starts out by showing a standard um, WebGL application, which is a simple WebGL app. It's a 3D uh, environment with uh, two uh, spheres. So this is running in, in the browser. Uh, so this is Safari in this case. And so you get pretty good interactivity. But if we turn on uh, dynamic deformation and do a lot of computation to do that deformation in floating point, we're overloading the JavaScript uh, engine. 
and the frame rate drops uh, right now, and uh, we're down to about like, one or two frames a second. Now, if we use WebCL to offload that deformation calculation back onto the GPU, uh, of course, it's significantly faster, and the frame rate jumps right back up to over 100 frames a second. So you can see the power of using WebCL and WebGL together. Um, a beachhead application might be a game that needs acceleration for a physics engine with WebCL, and of course the rendering through um, WebGL. Uh, so I think the two um, standards go very well together. So um, I'm going to finish off just with um, some um, updates on what the, uh, some of the working groups that we're not going to hear from are, are working on, and then I hand over to the other speakers. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're very committed to um, broaden our outreach here in China. There's a number of key players uh, in the Chinese industry, and it's good for China, and it's good for Fernos, and it's good for the industry if we have uh, participation from the Chinese companies. Um, it's going to avoid costs and market confusion uh, if you can avoid fragmentation. Uh, so the Kronos board has prioritized outreach here uh, in China uh, to uh, encourage uh, participation. We're targeting silicon vendors um, such as Huawei, uh, mobile OEMs, such as ETE, mobile carriers, such as uh, China Mobile, uh, to uh, get involved in the creation of these standards. We've actually been coming here to China since 2004. Um, so, but it's obvious we have more uh, work to do. We're here this week in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, we're going to come back uh, with the China Game Developer Conference in Shanghai in July. And actually, it looks like we'll be here a few more times uh, this year. And for the members that are here, um, any assistance you can provide in spreading the word uh, into the Chinese industry would be much appreciated. Next, face to face meeting. Uh, we have three face-to-face -face meetings a year where all of the working groups come together. It's where the main progress on the standards are made. Uh, the next one is in Dublin, in Ireland, um, and it's um, in April, April 23rd to 27th. Um, we encourage and welcome any members uh, to participate. If you want to participate and you haven't come to a face-to-face -face before, feel free to ask myself or Elizabeth. We will be you know, delighted to walk you through uh, the process. It's very straightforward. Some of the discussion topics, some of these will be covered uh, OpenGL, yes, OpenGL, and texture compression are hot topics in Dublin. Um, we're discussing what the direction for the future of OpenGL uh, is. Are we going to need to leave before DX12? Uh, we're setting the direction for OpenCL 2.0, and we're aiming for a release in 2013. Uh, we're um, looking at cross process uh, EGL streams. We're looking at um, making sure we actually ship WebCL stream input and OpenVL uh, in 2012. Uh, we want to drive the adoption of OpenMax AL and OpenSLES and uh, broaden their use cases to things such as DRM protected streaming. There's a project called OpenVG Express, which is uh, defining a subset of OpenVG to enable 100% acceleration over OpenGL ES2. Uh, we think that could go a long way to driving the more widespread adoption of OpenVG. Uh, OpenGL SC, the safety critical, Hawaiian will talk about that in a second. And something that's bubbling in the background hasn't been initiated yet, but the Kronos is trying to uh, track when would be the right time to do a ray tracing uh, standard, perhaps an open RL. Um, not quite the time yet, but that discussion keeps going at each each face to face. Just trying to give a flavour of um, the kind of discussions that we, we have. Uh, one, and actually, one of the working groups we have is Collada, uh, which is the three D interchange uh, format. Uh, the industry needs Collada. Um, it's a good counterbalance to FBX, which is the Autodesk proprietary uh, format. But we have an issue right now um, in that the uh, import-export from Collada is not uh, reliable uh, from many of the key applications. Um, but Collada has been used in a bunch of different places. Uh, it's now native to Mac OS Lion. Uh, it's um, 
uh, Central Park of High Books, Google's using it, Adobe's using it, the cat industry's using it, it's becoming an ISO standard. Um, but until we fix this import export problem, many normal folks doing gaming and other types of development uh, aren't finding Kalada is reliable. We have Open Kalada, which is a open source project, uh, but there are some bugs. Uh, Kronos is proposing that we open up uh, a collaborative project between Kronos and the community, um, kick start, start some uh, fixes to open Kalada, find an easier way to track conformance, and um, focus on the parts of Kalada that developers uh, need um, in practice. We're also discussing the need for a 3D transition uh, transmission format, uh, so all of the Rich media types have a format for transport of their media across a network, uh, apart from 3D. There's a lot of discussion on the requirements for this. Um, MPEG has been working on this for a long time, uh, MPEG 4 part 16, um, but it's not getting adoption. Uh, we actually have a meeting next week uh, in Texas where we're going to be discussing this with the MPEG folks, trying to figure out uh, what the path forward is, and whether Kronos can or should uh, play a role um, in fixing uh, this, this problem. And last but not least, face-to-face um, -face meetings. Uh, we go around the world. We haven't had enough in Asia, so I think we're going to be bringing some of the face-to-face -face meetings uh, to uh, Asia, and you know, again, we're interested in the feedback, whether we should bring them to Shanghai or Beijing. Okay, so in summary, the you know, our APIs are are enabling compelling applications on advanced hardware. Uh, there, it's an interesting time because the APIs are needing to work together, and we're bringing this, the APIs not just for native applications now, but into the web browser from HTML5. And as you know, as your kernels members already, um, you can participate, change the industry, and get an inside track for your own products. So again, thank you guys for being here today, and uh, we'll hand it over to the next speaker, which is John.